Well, hey, good morning again. How we doing? So something happened to me when I got married. Not just one thing, but this in particular thing happened. Uh, I became very sensitive to lights. So I would come home from working late at night, and I would walk up to the house or walk to the apartment, and every light is on in the home. And I would come in and be like, baby, why are all the lights on? You're not even in half these rooms. You're the only person here. She's like, oh, well, it just feels so much safer and so much more secure, so much more warm and homey when I'm just here by myself. And I'm like, well, you know, this costs money, blah, blah. When you become a a husband, like that just erupts out of you. It's like a volcano. It's like you've been wanting to tell people how much things cost for so long. And now I finally can tell somebody, you know, this costs money. So dad, that one's for you. So... She took the girls uh, up to Kansas for a visit, and I stayed here, and I came home late at night again, and everything was dark, and I was very unsettled by this. So you know what I did? I turned on all the lights in the house, (laughs) and I was like, I get it now. I understand. It makes you do, it it does make you feel safer and more secure, Uh, and you know why that is? You know why we like to be in the light? Because as a creature, you were made to be in the light. And that's not like some spiritual metaphor. I mean, it is. We're about to get there. But seriously, the primary sense that we use to function, our world is built around vision. It is built around sight. Now, can you function without it? Of course. And there are amazing people who are not able to see, who have learned to live and thrive and flourish in a society that is largely built around being able to read signs, being able to read text being able to look and make decisions. We are primarily visual creatures. And everything else operates around that. And in order to see, you have to have light. We are not capable of viewing things in the darkness. And spiritually, here we go, you are the exact same way. Your spiritual vision is no different than your physical vision. You have got to have light in order to see. And so we're looking at the second of Jesus' I am statements in the Gospel of John, where he says, I am the, thank you, I am the light of the world. We're going to be in John chapter 8, verse 12 is where we're going to start. And this is why we're encouraging you to be in dwell. If you, have, if you have read through John, the beginning parts of John, like we're doing together in dwell, you've already seen where John talks a lot about light. John loves light. The light-dark comparison, he uses them all the time. And so you've already seen where he says, Uh, The light has come into the world and the darkness has not overcome it or understood it. So you've already seen how important it is even before we get to today's passage. But today I want us to talk about what is light. And to help us understand that, we're then going to talk about what is darkness. And then how do we turn on the light in our life? So first let's talk about what is light. Verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, Jesus is most likely teaching this from the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, this is a great feast. In fact, most scholars believe that this was actually more popular than Passover. It was more significant than the Passover feast that goes on around Easter time. What this celebration was, it was the celebration of the harvest and the ingathering of the harvest. And so people would come to Jerusalem and they would offer sacrifices to thank God for a successful harvest. And what they would do is they would live in these temporary houses called booths or tabernacles. And they'd stay in the city for a week. And it was to also commemorate their wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Because now they have food that grows from the ground rather than waiting on the manna from heaven. They've got more security, and God is still providing, just providing in a more what they would consider secure or reliable way. So it's a very joyous festival. And a part of this festival are lights, tons of lights, just a very illuminated festival. Think of like Christmas time, how we've got lights everywhere. Some of you still have lights everywhere. (laughs) There were four giant kind of cauldrons on the temple courtyard that would blaze all night. Men would, would worship and would dance, yes, worshiping and dancing, men, all through the night with giant torches. And they said there was so much light that you could see 
from miles away the glow of the city of Jerusalem. And against this backdrop, I just kind of picture, I don't know if this is true, I don't know when Jesus said this, but I, I kind of picture him in the night, kind of teaching a late night Bible study and being like, you see all this? You see this glow? I am the light of the world. The glow that the city provides for the surrounding area, I am this for the whole world. I am the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. That's what he says. And I think it's interesting, too, because it's a powerful, powerful metaphor in Scripture. Light constantly comes up. And the religious leaders, they have issues with what Jesus is saying. And it's not just because he says, I am, and that's kind of this divinely heavy statement. It's because they believe that something else is the light. They believe wholeheartedly that the light of the world is the law. The law of God, and what's more is their interpretation of the law. We'll get to that in a minute. They believe that's the light of the world. And so they think that if you follow the law of God, if everybody follows the law of God and keeps their rules like they're supposed to, then you will live this illuminated, uh, sort of purposeful life, and everything will be happy and good. And what's interesting is it's hard to push back on it because you're like, well, it is God's word. He did give it to us. It is a light. Even scripture itself says that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But it's not the light. It's not the light of the world. It's interesting. Judaism and Christianity are not the only ones who lay claim to light as a religious metaphor. Nearly every single religion appeals to the light-dark sort of contrast, the, the competition between light and dark to show the difference between living an, uh, a, a purposeless sort of immoral life versus living a purposeful moral life. Every religion does it. Think about Buddhism. What is it, Buddhism? Uh, you seek enlightenment, right? And I think this is the reason why this is is because every single person kind of understands, sort of, sort of understands instinctually that unless I have something in my life to guide me to, to some purpose, some goal, some overriding values or principles, then what's going to happen is I'm going to resort to my instincts, to my desires, to my needs, and I'm going to live this meandering, purposeless life. You have to have something that guides you, something that, that motivates you, something that gets you out of the bed in the morning to have meaning in life. You've got to have a light. You've got to have something to illuminate your path other than just your wants and needs. Your cat does not wake up in the morning and think, you know what, God, I just kind of lay around all day and they feed me. I should write a book. I should start a side hustle. I could catch rats and like cook them for people. The cat, the cat doesn't think about, that was gross, I'm sorry. The cats don't think about that. And they're not just because they're cats. And they're like, I love being waited on. No, dogs don't think about it. Birds don't think about it. Animals do not think about their purpose in life. But we do. And if we fall back onto our instincts, we fall back onto our emotions, it's because we don't have light. We walk in darkness. But it's not just enough to have something guide you, right? It's got to be something that's true. You can't just have a purpose. You've got to have a true thing guide you. So if I were to tell you that my purpose in life, I feel like God's called me to have a family and be a teacher, you'd be like, oh, commendable goal. That's good. That fits within our societal norms. That is a good light. But what if I told you the family that I wanted to have was like a small family of squirrels and I was going to teach them to do acrobatic tricks I have a family and I'm teaching them. Some of you are like, that's really weird. Like, what kind of a person thinks of that? This kind of a person. That's not a commendable goal. That's not true. That's not a real family. No offense if you have a bunch of squirrels. It's not a real family. That's not really teaching. It has to be true. And it has to guide you. It has to be true. And it has to guide you. That's what a genuine light is does. You see, here's the thing about light. White light, you can't see, right? But you see everything else by light. 
Now, I texted my wife this week because it hit me when I was walking to a lunch. And I was like, oh, you don't see light, but by everything else, you see light. And so I texted her because I didn't want to forget it. And I thought she'd think it was really cool. You know what she fired back to me? I love my wife. She's like, this is, this is the problems of dating somebody who's getting, uh, dating somebody, yeah. being married to somebody who, uh, we still date, it's fun. <laughs> being married to somebody who's getting a PhD in theology, they know more than you. And so she fires back. She's like, didn't C.S. Lewis say that? And I'm like, well, regardless, I came up with it without him. So I'm at least as smart as he is. Get off my case. You see everything. The way you view the world is by whatever guides your life. What you find value in, what you find significant, the way you think about other people, all of that is based on what illuminates your life. The way you spend your time, all of that is based on the light that guides your life. Whatever the lighthouse is that kind of guides the ships of your family. That's you, that's your light. And Jesus is saying two really important things here about him. Himself. Look at this. In verse 12, he says, Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. So that's the first important thing. I am the light of the world. What he's saying here is that light, what guides your life and what guides my life, could be different things. So I super love baseball. In fact, there are many days, probably about 160 of them, that I organize my day around getting to watch baseball. Not, not that many, but it's close. I love baseball. And some of you sit there and you think to yourself, that sounds like a wasted life. That sounds terrible. How can somebody watch that much baseball? That's not your light. That doesn't illuminate you. That doesn't do anything for you. For some of you, it's your career. For some of you, it's your family. For some of you, it's a hobby that you have. And what Jesus is saying is, I am the only universal light. I am the only thing that will illuminate everybody's light, life. It, it's, not, it's not based on person. It's not based on gender. It's not based on sexual orientation. It's not based on race. It's not based on ethnicity. I am the light of the world. Full stop. He applies to everybody. But then he goes on. He keeps talking. He says, I'm the light of the world. I'm for everybody. And whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Light is essential to life on earth. It's not just heat. We don't just need the heat from the sun. We need the light too. We're about to go to first, ninth grade chemistry class, right? Or biology class. Photosynthesis takes place using light. You can have a plant and you can keep it well watered. You can keep it well heated. But if it doesn't have light, if you keep it in the dark, it will die. Plants produce fruit if they have light you will produce spiritual fruit only if you have the light of Christ. If you're wondering why your life lacks love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all the other spiritual fruit that's mentioned in Galatians 5, it might be because we're in darkness. It might be because you're not in the light. You're not walking in the light. The light of the world is not the light of your life. So that's what the light is. The light is this guiding thing, this thing that you organize your life around. And so when Jesus is the light of your life, you organize your life around him. He's the center. And it's okay to have other little lights. It's okay to have other little stars, but the sun of your life needs to be Jesus Christ. And they need to, to, just like the stars disappear in the sky when the sun's in the sky because it's so bright, Christ's light in your life should make all other lights seem really dim. But we can further understand light by talking about darkness. What is darkness? Verse 13. So the Pharisees said to him, you're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. How would you describe darkness? If you had to tell it to somebody, what would you say about it? If you look it up in the dictionary, it just says the absence of light. It's one of those few things in the world that we can really only describe negatively by talking about what it's not. Darkness is the absence of light. 
In Scripture, darkness is often equated with chaos. So when God speaks creation into existence, the first thing he creates is light. He says, let there be light, right? You see, darkness is chaos in Scripture. Light is order. And so oftentimes, we don't know that we're walking in darkness until all of our lights have gone out, right? You don't know you're in trouble until all the lights go out. You're sitting in your house, there's a storm raging outside, and the power goes out. And you're like, oh, this is a problem. You bang your knee against the coffee table, and you're like, I don't understand or know where the breaker is. You start stumbling and fumbling around in darkness. But what if, what if there was a way that we could tell that we were walking in darkness, that we were in danger of, of being plunged into darkness before we ever got to that point, before your life gets chaotic? Because if your job is the light of your life, when you lose your job, you'll be plunged into darkness and chaos. If it's your family, you'll be plunged into darkness and chaos. You wonder why so many couples get divorced after the kids move out. It's because the light of their life were their kids. And they're plunged into darkness. They don't know what to do with themselves. When you lose your light, your world will be plunged into chaos. And I would rather you know what you're heading for than to wait until you get plunged into darkness. So here's four things. The Pharisees are so helpful. They show us four things that let us know we're walking in darkness. The first is that you're argumentative. Verse 13. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. This is such a great argument by the Pharisees. I'm serious. This is the best argument they ever give. And if you have kids or you've been around kids, you're familiar with this argument. It's the uh-uh, no, you're not argument. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And they're like, no, you're not. Says you. It's literally, that's, that's the Travis translation. Yo, that joke killed in the first service. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. <laughs> Get it together. I expect more from you. I expect more from 11 o'clock. You've slept longer. No, you went to connect group. The pump has been primed. The irony is that light does not need a second to be real, right? I don't, you don't have to tell me the lights are on. I can see them. The lights are on, right? You see, again, the Pharisees knew. They, they wanted something else to be their light. That's what they wanted. And when you spend time with Jesus, if you're walking in darkness, what happens is you get argumentative with him. You read something out of the Bible or you hear a pastor say something or you hear something on a podcast and you're like, yeah, I don't know that that applies to me. Or you start being like, no, eh, that does apply to me. But what's a way that I can make it where it doesn't quite apply to me so much that I have to give up what I don't want to give up? Or, and this is a Baptist classic, I know somebody else that really needs to hear this. <laughs> Yo, we coined that. If Baptist has creeds, which we don't, but if we did, that would be like one of them. We would have this like title, like, like chapter nine, you will apply every scripture to someone else and then use it in a prayer request so you can gossip about people. When you spend time with Jesus, when you spend time with the Lord, if you are spending more time trying to wiggle out of what he wants to tell you to do, you're walking in darkness. Here's the thing. Light amplifies light. Darkness amplifies darkness. Light agrees with light. Darkness agrees with darkness. And that's how you know. That's one of the ways you know. Another way that you know, another way that you know is that you're directionless. Verse 14, Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. Jesus knows exactly who he is. He understands exactly what role he is supposed to play in God's plan, and the Pharisees don't get it. At best, the Pharisees are directionless. At worst, they're actually running counter to what God wants to do, which they seem to, they're supposed to know what God wants. They have no idea. When you're walking in darkness, when Christ is not your light, you'll be directionless. You won't know what God wants from you. You'll constantly be like, I don't know what he wants from me. I don't know what he wants me to do. And you'll despair over it. You'll get frustrated about it. Just like you get frustrated stumbling in the dark and you bang your knee against a coffee table. You're like, ah, why is that coffee table there? Because you put it there. And it was fine when you could see it. 
And look, here's the worst thing. I understand every single one of us go through seasons of life where maybe the light of Christ seems a little dimmer and we begin to ask questions about what God wants from us. That's fine. But if you don't ever seek the answers, if you're somebody that's like, I don't know what God wants from me, and you're like, oh, well, and you move on, that's walking in darkness. People that walk in darkness don't ever try to turn on the light. If there is zero effort to turn on the light, if you're struggling with something, you're walking, you got an addiction, something you're like super ashamed of, you're like, how can I be a follower of Christ? I get that. I've been there. Might I offer a suggestion? One of the, one of the, way, one of the things to give you hope is do you even try to get out of it? Do you even try? When you're directionless, you fall back on those same habits, those instincts, right? The light doesn't let us do that. You're also judgmental. Judgmental is another hallmark of darkness. Verse 15, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Jesus tells them that they judge based on appearances. Which with Jesus, there's a lot to judge. Like There's a lot about him that kind of throws people off. He's from Nazareth. He's not supposed to be there. He hangs out with all the wrong kinds of people. He doesn't hang out with the right kind of people. And so the Pharisees really are thrown off by this guy. But because they only judge by appearances, because they can only judge based on what they see, their judgment's messed up. Their judgment is skewed. And they judge everybody this way. They judge everybody this way. Remember when you were a kid and mom and dad would come and put you to bed, they'd tuck you in, give you a kiss goodnight, and then they'd turn off the light. How many of you had nightlights in your room when you were kids? Okay, a lot of you were braver than I was. I had nightlights in the kids. And nightlights are supposed to help you because they're supposed to give you, and some of you just didn't want to admit you were scared of the dark. I get it, okay. So nightlights are supposed to brighten the, the room a little bit, right? So you can see a little bit. It's not quite so scary. But what do nightlights do? Nightlights cast really weird shadows. And so that pile of laundry that you've got in the corner all of a sudden becomes this soul-sucking monster from the abyss, and you're terrified of it. The curtain blowing in the breeze is this like ghost with icy claws coming to get you, right? And you're terrified because of the nightlight. The nightlight's not helping. For some of us, when the light that guides you is something that's a dim light, when it's not Christ, and they're all dim lights and they're not Christ, they cast really long shadows and they turn other people into monsters. People that we then judge, we look down on, we discredit. If the light of your life is your career and success and climbing that ladder, and people aren't as successful as you are, they don't climb the ladder as high as you do, you judge them for it. How could they not? How could they not want to do that? How could they waste their life and their time like that? They're monsters. When the light of your life, this is, I mean, this is what happens. When the light of your life is your politics, you vilify the other group. Why? Because in the dim light of your political convictions, they become monsters. Light casts long shadows if it's a dim light. And it really turns people into things that are scary to us. If you vilify other people, if you judge other people, you're in darkness. You're in darkness. A very dim light. And then the last thing, last way to know is you keep other people in the dark. Verse 17. Verse 17. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Notice he says, in your law. Now, this is not a shot at God's law. He's not saying that God's law is not his law. That's not what he's saying at all. He's, he's criticizing their interpretation of the law. Because what the Pharisees would do is they would enslave everybody else to their interpretation. So if you keep reading in John chapter 8, he actually says again later on that he's the light of the world again. But he says it in chapter 9 when he heals a man born blind. And there's this whole thing. The whole of chapter 9 is this argument between this poor man who was blind and now can see and the religious establishment, and then they bring in his parents. And he's like, Jesus healed me. And they're like, no, he didn't. And so they call in his parents, and they're like, hey, was your son blind? And they're like, he's an adult. You can ask him. Because they're trying to not get thrown out of the synagogue. And so they go back to him, and, Jesus, and he's like, I told you that he did. Like, do you want to become his followers too? 
which is like the worst thing you could possibly say. So they throw him out of the synagogue. When you walk in the darkness, you want to keep other people in the dark with you. Because you know what's scarier than being in the dark? Being in the dark alone. Being in the dark by yourself. And so when other people start growing in Christ, when other people start finding the light of Christ and you're not, you try to hold them back. You try to say, "Mm -mm, no, 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 no. I don't want to go to church with you. I don't want to do that thing with you. Why are you reading your Bible so much? Why are we giving money to the church? This is money that we worked for. Why are we being so generous? When you are in the dark, you want to keep other people in the dark because it makes you feel better. And that's how you know you're in the dark. Are you argumentative? Are you directionless? Are you judgmental? And do you try to keep other people there with you? That's how you know you're in the dark. The bottom line is this. If all these four things summed up together, you know what it creates? Ugliness. Things are ugly in the dark. You know why they're ugly in the dark? You know why things are ugly in the dark? Because nobody has to be pretty when the lights are off. Darkness breeds ugliness. Allow me to give you an example. This picture right here is of a clownfish. It's a tropical fish. He's off to find his son, Nemo, and he's adorable. He lives about three to 30 feet beneath the, uh, the sea level, lives in coral reefs with other tropical fish. And if you've ever been snorkeling in the, in the, in the Caribbean or anything, you've seen this and they're beautiful. All the colors. This is an abyssal sea devil. She lives 6,600 feet below sea level, lives most of her life in darkness, and she is terrifying. She has no need to be beautiful. You know why? Because it's dark where she lives. And I keep saying she because the only species, uh, only the females look like that. Which there's not, I'm not going to make a joke about that. (laughs) But what I will say this, I will make a joke about. The males are very tiny. They latch on to the females and they suck their blood to live. And some of you ladies have dated guys like that. (laughs) There you go. See, I will make a joke about that. (laughs) Ugly things grow in the dark. You know what grows in the dark? Mold, fungus, abyssal sea devils. And some of you have all that growing in your life. Some of you live in such darkness. It's like the Marianas Trench down there. No light comes in. Beautiful things grow in the light. And so I would encourage you, if you have some darkness in your life, if you're a follower of Christ and you're just sick of the darkness in your life, you know what you do? You confess. That's the only way to bring it into the light. You confess. You confess to the Lord. You find a brother and sister to confess to. You confess to your spouse. You confess to somebody and say, I've got this darkness in my life and I can't live with it anymore or I don't want to live with it anymore. You got to confess because ugly things grow in the dark. So how do we turn on the light? How do we turn on the light? Let's skip down to verse 24. I told you, that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So John talks a lot. Uh, He has very long sections in the Bible. And so I wanted to skip down to 24 to get to the part where where Jesus is basically telling the Pharisees the problem with their response. He's saying, you're going to die in your sins. Now, one of the misconceptions that we make as believers is that we think, and I said this last week in the chapel service, uh, we think eternal life starts after you die. It's like you come to know Jesus, and then you kind of wait to die, and then when you die, you then have eternal life. That's not how it works. Eternal life begins the moment that you accept Christ. When you come to put your faith in Christ, that is eternal life. On the flip side, if you are not a follower of Christ, then death doesn't begin at death. Death is now. Spiritual deadness is now. And Scripture teaches that that spiritual death leads to a place called hell. And so he's like, oh, hell's this destination. It's not real. It's later. No, 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 no. If eternal life starts when you accept Christ, then some of us experience hell now. It's darkness. John Milton wrote Paradise Lost, has this great description of hell. It's, it's terrifyingly beautiful. 
And what he says is, he says that he looked around and he saw a giant furnace. And from the furnace was great flames, but from the flames came no light and no heat, but instead darkness visible. And that's what some of our lives look like. Darkness visible. And from your life comes no light, no heat, just visible darkness. And this is why you need the light of the world. This is why we need Jesus Christ. Because every single person at some point has had visible darkness, has been visible darkness in the life of the world. And until you come to Christ, that's what you offer. That's what, that's what comes out. And a lot of times what happens is we say, oh, oh, I want Jesus. I'd like to have Jesus in my life. You don't understand. You need Jesus. You need him. In the same way that we need light to function and live and to survive in this world, you need Jesus. He's not a nice commodity to have. He's not an additional lamp to add to your collection of lights. You need him. And I know what some of you think. You think, Travis, you don't understand the darkness that's in my life. You don't understand I need like an LED light and Jesus is this really old light. I understand that and I sympathize with it. But the thing about following Jesus is this. The more you trust him, the brighter his light gets. And his light is the only light that can penetrate deep into the dark parts of our lives into the visible darkness that swallows all other lights. Jesus is the only one that can survive it, the only one who can conquer it. He's the only one. Because what happened is Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected for our sins. And here's the thing. That's like the power plant. That gives the opportunity for light into every single home. Your faith, you trusting in Jesus Christ rather than your own works, rather than your own, own efforts, rather than the own little lights that you're able to conjure up. When you trust in Jesus Christ, that's like going to the breaker box and flipping it on. And the power of Christ comes into your life. And then the rest of the Christian life, you know what it is? You going from room to room of your life and flipping on light switches. That's what it is. How do I follow Christ at work? Let's flip on that light switch. How do I follow Christ at home? Let's flip on that light switch. You're just flipping on light switches. And then your home burns like a beacon of hope to the people in the darkness around you. Turn on the light. This is why we're doing dwell. Because we believe that spending time in the word, getting closer, spending time with Jesus, getting to know him, Connecting to that power source will shine light brightly. And one of the biggest problems we have, if you've spent any amount of time in church, one of the biggest challenges we have with faith is expecting God to do something. I get it, because you're like, Lord, I want to trust you, but like, I don't know what to expect. Again, let's go back to creation. What is the first thing that God said? The first words uttered in all creation is what? Let there be light. And then what's next? What happens next? And there was. And there was. When you call out for the light of God, when you call out for the light of Jesus Christ, and there was. And then what does he say? And it was good. And it was good. Do you want goodness in your life? Do you want light in your life? Christ stands as the light of the world and he says, let there be light. And there was and it was good. And he's here to give it into the darkness of everybody's life, even mine today. Trust him. Flip on that switch. Let him give you the gift of faith. Ask for it. Call out for it. Let there be light. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the light of your word, for the light of your life, and for your death, your burial, and resurrection that by faith we may have access to the light. I don't have to be in darkness anymore, and I've been forgiven for my darkness. You've set me free to live in the light. Let us please, Lord God, seek out your light. 
It's in your name we pray.